Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module that's part of our catch-up series um, of the BITS RHI course. This particular session is um, part of the complicated TB cases, and this is case number two, which is a drug-induced liver injury case. So this case um, outlines the story of Mr. AZ, a 62-year-old man who presented to the accident and emergency with confusion. His wife gives a bit of further history. He's had a week of nausea and vomiting, and he's had two days of worsening confusion. He was last seen at his local CHC about six weeks ago, where he complained of shortness of breath and right-sided pleuritic chest pain. He was started on antituberculosis therapy at the time, which he was picking up from his local clinic. When you examine him, you find an elderly gentleman, no adenopathy, no jaundice, but he's got a very low GCSS of 6 over 15, no meningitis, um, no focal deficits. Um, the chest is hyperinflated, a bit of dull with decreased breath sounds on the right lower zone. There's no ascites, and he's got apoptosis with a tender right upper quadrant. So they took an urgent um, kidney function, urgent full blood count and liver function tests. Our U, our U and E and full blood count is not particularly significant, a little bit of an increased white cell count. What's very important is the results on the liver function tests. Note that the total bilirubin there is 105. The ALP and gamma DT is slightly up, but not significantly so. But the ALT is 1,034 and the AST is 1,936. So this is a predominant hepatocellular picture. What is also of concern is the INR of 4, which already shows major dysfunction um, in the basic cellular function of the liver and is an indication of your progression towards liver failure. So let's take a step back and just think a little bit about what do we need to think about in terms of elevated liver functions, and specifically in our HIV-positive patient who may or may not recently have been started um, on prophylaxis, Bactrim, on TB treatment, and often on ARVs. Um, and quite often these patients were quite well. We started them on their TB treatment, we started them on their ARVs, and now they're coming jaundiced and unwell. When we think in terms of liver functions, we always think in terms of our two major polarities. Is this more a hepatocellular picture to do with the liver cell damage, or is this more of a cholestatic picture to do with more infiltration or pressure on the liver? So as we remember from medical school, our ALT and AST is going to tell us more about the hepatocellular side. And on the cholestatic side, it's going to be more your um, ALK phosphatase and your gamma GT. Now, when you look at a liver function test and everything is up, it's quite sensible to just focus on your ALT as a marker for the hepatocellular side and your ALP as a marker for the cholestatic side um, when you're looking at differentiating what is going on for your patient on TB treatment. So hepatocellular damage is most often caused by your drug, um, by drugs that the patient is on or by viruses. That's probably your two major causes with alcohol being a very, very late cause of, of either hepatocellular or cholestatic picture on your, on your LFTs. So your main worry with hepatocellular is, is this a drug-induced liver injury or is this perhaps caused by one of your hepatitis viruses? On the other side, your biggest cause of your cholestatic side is um, a TB iris. So the patient's been started on TB treatment, started on ARVs, and now there's a worsening of their TB disease, a paradoxical TB iris, um, which is causing an increase in the ALP and gamma GT as lymph nodes press on the liver or even infiltration into the liver itself. More uncommonly, in chronic patients, you can have patients who are in long-term D4 TDDI that can develop fatty livers. Um, and there is a condition, HIV cholangiopathy, again, not common in, and mostly in our patients with very low CD4 counts, where the HIV is actually directly attacking the gallbladder system. But if you look at this slide, you can see in our patient who's recently started on TB and um, TB treatment and ARVs, the question in our minds is, is this a drug-induced liver injury? or is this a TB iris? And it's relatively easy to exclude whether it's hepatitis B or A or C. You can easily test for that and make sure it's not an infection. Um, but it's not so easy to differentiate between a drug-induced liver injury and TB iris. 
So this is some of the things that can give you a little bit of a clue, and they're not actually set in stone. Um, but generally, with your drug-induced liver injury, what you can imagine is that you've got a, you've got a, a, a very irritated liver, um, and the liver itself can actually be quite tender, but it's not necessarily enlarged. The patient might be jaundiced because of the increased bilirubin, but it's your ALT and your AST predominantly elevated. And look more at your ALT than your AST. There's lots of other reasons why the AST might be increased. On the other hand, your TB iris patient um, can also have a tender liver, but it tends to be more of a hepatomegaly if they've actually got infiltration of the TB into the liver. Less jaundice than with our dillies. Um, and actually, the, the hepatocellular function seems to keep going quite well for quite some time. You might also see TB in others, other areas. So the patient's whole TB picture might be getting worse. He might be developing more night sweats or more fever. Um, but importantly, it's also more a cholestatic picture. So your ALP and your gamma GT is more up. And again, if you're going to look at one of those, you're going to look at your um, ALK phosphatase. Now, in about two or three years ago, a very helpful consensus statement was published in the HIV Clinician Society um, of South Africa's journal. Uh, the name there is the Management of Drug-Induced Liver Injury in HIV-Positive Patients Treated for TB. And this has been an incredible useful guideline for doctors working in rural district hospital facilities. Um, prior to this guideline, different people were using different guidelines and different protocols inherited from, for example, the American Thoracic um, Society or from Britain um, or from your own personal university. And there's been no real um, study of how best to manage Dili in the South African setting. And this consensus statement is um, very well thought out and gives nice step-by-step -step approaches for patients in rural facilities. The recommendations in this little case study is based on this consensus statement and I truly believe that every single doctor working in a rural hospital CHC setting must have a copy of this and be familiar with its contents. In the notes section below there will be a link um, where you can find the guideline. The consensus statement highlights a nice clear definition for drug-induced liver injury. Um, and there are three possible scenarios. The one is patients who has an ALT level of over 120 and is symptomatic. So these are our sick patients with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. They might be jaundiced and they have an ALT of over 120. If your patient is asymptomatic, once the ALT goes over 200, that would be concerned um, and would be defined as a DILI. So any patient with an ALT over 200 and or any patient with a total serum bilirubin of over 40. In the consensus statement, they particularly highlight the scenario of patients who have a serum bilirubin of over 40, but might even have a normal or low level of, of ALT. And those we see in patients on rifampicin who quite often develop an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia about two to four weeks after starting rifampicin, um, but their ALT levels might still be quite normal. And the guideline gives a very nice step-by-step -step approach to those patients. This is a brief summary of how we manage once we've defined it. And basically, in patients where the ALT is over 200, but they're still asymptomatic, we don't yet consider that a proper DILI, but we do need to watch them closely. But anybody else that we have classified as having a drug-induced liver injury with a bilirubin over 40 or a symptomatic patient or an ALT over 200, we have to stop all of the treatment that they're on. So that includes the TB drugs and the ART if they've started on that ART in the last um, six months. And you can see you, want, you would want to do a liver, full liver function test then to really get a better picture of what's going on. And remember to test your INR and monitor your blood glucose um, just to see how severely the liver has been affected. In our particular gentleman who was very sick at this point, he was intubated and ventilated. He was started on IVI KEF, oral metronidazole and lactulose, and they stopped all treatment that he was on. So important to stop the TB treatment, but you might have some patients that are quite sick with their TB and you might be concerned 
to actually leave the TB treatment. So the TB is making them quite ill. And in those cases, you can use a liver safe regimen. So in the old days, we used to use streptomycin. We usually don't have streptomycin, so you can use either canamycin or amikacin. And you combine that with ethambutyl and moxifloxacin. Very important to use all three. Um, and this is not a good regimen if they've got a low EGR. You might have just discussed those patients. But if the patient was also on ARVs, you would need to stop the offending ARVs. And usually with ARVs, we are concerned about the efavirenz. Um, but we are going to stop the whole regimen while we are sorting out um, whether it's the TB treatment or the ARVs. Just remember, if you do stop nevirapine or efavirenz, you have to cover the tail of the efavirenz. The efavirenz takes much longer to be excreted out of the body. And so you will stop the nevirapine, you will stop the, all the ARVs today, and you will continue with your NRTI backbone, your tenofovir and the 3DC for another week to cover that week where there might be a favorin still in the bloodstream. If they are on a protease inhibitor, that's not necessary, and you can stop all the drugs in one time. If you have patients who's actually been on ARVs for six months, now you start them on TB treatment, and now they get a dilly, that's probably more likely going to be the TB treatment. And if they're not too sick, you would probably continue your ARVs throughout that. Also remember to stop any other hepatotoxic drugs, which includes your cotramoxazole um, and your fluconazole. So some of our results have now come back of our patient who's been admitted to ICU. We can see the hepatitis A, B, and C there is negative. The pleural fluid still shows that there's an exudate there, which confirms that we still believe that there is TB with that very high um, ADA there. That's quite important because if you're thinking of a drug-induced liver injury, you want to ask yourself the question, well, does the patient have to be on TB treatment? Um, and if there was doubt about the TB diagnosis, it might not be worthwhile to, to reintroduce TB treatment. But in this case, we, are, we have confirmed that the patient does have TB and that his symptoms was not caused by hepatitis. So we are very suspicious that this is probably a drug-induced liver injury. So if you've stopped all your ARVs, you now have to wait till the patient is well enough and we can reintroduce the medication. So you're going to be monitoring your ALT as well as your bilirubin. And as an inpatient, you will usually do that every three days. You will wait until your ALT is less than 100 and the bilirubin is sort of approaching normal. The patient at least is not jaundiced any longer. In this particular patient, he started getting better. He was exubated after five days. Um, and you can see that the LFTs have improved dramatically. The ALT has already come back to 129. The INR has basically normalized. The gamma GT is a little bit up. I wouldn't be too concerned about that probably has to do with a TB picture that is not properly being treated at the moment. Once the patient's ALT is settling, you're now going to reintroduce the TB treatment, and the guideline very nicely takes you through a step-by-step -step process. So it doesn't really matter too much the order in which you reintroduce them. Important is that you check every three days, and important that although the patient will um, you can happily introduce your ethambutol. The patient is usually already on ethambutol if they're on a liver safe regimen. So you're going to introduce over on the top of your ethambutol your rifampicin, um, check your ALT, and then your INH. Very important, the drug that's causing us the most suspicion of having caused the drug reaction, especially in somebody that was so ill, um, would be your PZA. And we don't routinely consider re-challenging this PZA. Scenarios where you might decide to try PZA again are scenarios where the TB that the patient has, for example, a TB meningitis um, or a very, very sick patient with TB, you might decide that we need the PZA if we really want to be able to manage the TB properly. I would not introduce PZA without having discussed that with a consultant. So in this particular patient, we were not so much worried about the TB as we were about the drug reaction. And therefore, PZA was not reintroduced. And um, you can see there that three months later, the ALT had come down to 19, and the total bilirubin had completely recovered. As we mentioned in the drug um, reaction uh, lecture, if there's a particular drug that you reintroduce and then you discover that you can't use it, um, there are specific regimens that you would have to use if you can't use that drug. And you'll see at the bottom there with this patient, because we cannot use PZA, we didn't want to try and risk using PZA again. 
This patient will be on rifampicin, iron age, and ethambutol as a regimen for nine months. So please, please do go and read that consensus statement. Have a copy available on your table. Um, and remember that definition of drug-induced liver injury. Any ALT over 200 or an ALT over 125 um, where the patient is symptomatic or a bilirubin of over 40. In those scenarios, don't play around. There's a high mortality if you try and treat through those. Um, and it's very important to stop all of your possible hepatotoxins at that time. You're obviously going to look for other causes of hepatitis and just be very careful to differentiate from iris. If it is a predominant cholestatic picture and the ALT is still under 125, that patient is absolutely essential that they stay on their TB treatment um, and the ARBs, and it would be a disaster to stop the treatment at that point. Thank you.